five, six, seven, eight. Nine, eight, seven, six. I grew up in a family in which we were interested in organic food and the mind-body connection, actually. My father was a dentist and holistically oriented, and he would say that you can tell the state of somebody's health by looking in their mouth, and that also the mouth is the center of the personality, and that's why no one likes you mucking around in there, and why dentists have the second highest suicide rate second to psychiatrists in that the mouth is perhaps less demoralizing than looking into their mind. Um, so I grew up with a different take. My aunt and uncle were both medical doctors, straight medical doctors, and they made fun of my father's ideas, but he was always happier. And our family did not believe too much in conventional medicine, so my earliest memories are of having my brother uh, Billy being signed out of the hospital against medical advice. He wouldn't eat and uh, a nurse came up to my mother and said get him out of here The doctors don't know what's going on. He'll die if he stays here and I'd had a sister who died in a hospital uh, Early on and she didn't eat either and we never knew what was wrong with her so Imagine you're a kid. I'm eight at this time and my little brother is home and he has a tube down his throat and my parents are feeding him by tube every hour on the hour and he's throwing it back up and at the age of a year he's, he was alive at the age of a year he weighed 10 pounds and my parents tried to find a doctor who knew what was going on and they finally found a woman doctor Dr. Crump at Women's Medical Center in Philadelphia who did pediatric endoscopy put a tube down and said his esophagus is so eroded from this tube that if you continue to tube feed him that way, his esophagus will erode through, there'll be a big hole in it, and he will die. Let's take out the tube and see what happens. And so she had enough faith in the healing power of the human body that she took out the tube and they gave him liquids through what was called clysis, where you put a big bolus of fluid with a big needle into the thigh. And after a couple days, he started to eat. And we still don't know why. And I remember going to the airport, and my mother was holding him on her lap. And he was eating a roll that the stewardess had given him. And we all started to cry. And when I went to medical school, which I wasn't going to do. I never wanted to be a doctor. I thought my aunt and uncle's life looked not fun. They had to leave every Thanksgiving and every Christmas. But I remember thinking, when I go to medical school, I want to find out why doctors don't talk to patients. I want to find out why the fullness of the mystery is not addressed. And I never intended to practice medicine. But I always believed from my childhood experiences that there was more going on than what we were taught. Now, and like most medical students, I became puffed up. I became very proud of what we could do with drugs and surgery. And but when I saw the first time I saw a baby born, I started to cry. I just wept with a combination, really, of joy and also sorrow. And the nurse was yelling at the medical student. And she because uh, he had let go of the cord and they're like a mini fire hose and it was going all over the wall and I'm thinking this is holy this is a holy place this is not a place where you yell at anybody and it occurred to me nobody should be in that room during a birth who didn't know this was holy and it was that experience that caused me to become an obstetrician gynecologist and being around women giving birth was like being like breathing, it was that easy. But I also saw that fear and anger and all of this completely messed up the process of birth. But I didn't know how to get those ideas across to the patient, especially if her mother had already told her, now you'll see how I suffered with you. And I did all kinds of work trying to um, prove to myself that the mind-body connection was real and how did we uh, how did we get into the mind so that the body would change I myself had terrible migraine headaches from the age of 12 to the age of 21 
once a month, twice a month, whatever. I'd been worked up in a Boston hospital a week there with all kinds of testing. They never knew what it was. <clears throat> At the age of 19, I had to um, do this English paper, um, a critique of the poem Ode on a Grecian Urn or Ode to a Grecian Urn by Keats. And I didn't know what the professor wanted. And like most migrainous personalities, I needed to know what it was they wanted of me. And I couldn't figure it out. And it was in Cleveland, Ohio. And it was in November. And when I came out of the library, not knowing how to get an A in the course, I temporarily thought, maybe I should just throw myself in front of a car. It would be easier than this. And then I thought, no, you know, no, you'll break your leg. And then you're going to have to do the poem. And then you're going to have to lug around a cast at the same time. Like, it, you know, the idea that I had a choice never occurred to me because I was operating on a belief system that was obsolete. I go back to my dorm. I call my parents. And I say, I hate it here. This isn't working for me. And my father says, quit. So quit. You can come home. And I changed my mind. And in that moment, I changed the migraine headaches. I maybe had three or four the rest of my whole life because I changed this pattern, this sixth emotional center, perception, thought, morality, which is what headaches are. And my perception was, you must do this. And you, I've you know, really been driven my whole life to get it right. And get it right, though, in the way that the culture, and, and in my case, the practice of medicine says is right. But here's the problem. Most of what I was taught in medicine about what causes disease is not the truth. I cured my migraine headaches, not with Imitrex, not with Advil. I cured them with a change of perception, you see. And the only time that I got them from then on is when I was doing something migraineous, like trying to clean up my entire house in half of a day, because I had the time. Now, if I could just organize the clutter from 25 years, and I can get in this state of being driven, where I'm completely disconnected from my mind and my body, and I'm just going for it. It's a beautiful way to get through a surgical subspecialty. Keep your head down, keep your nose to the grindstone. <laughs> But you know what happens when you do that? You get cortisol levels that are too high, adrenaline levels that are too high. These are the stress hormones. They constrict blood vessels in every place in the body. And headaches are just the beginning. So the belief system behind the migraines, which I had for as long as I could remember, was you must get straight A's in school. It was this internal pressure. You must perform to a certain level. And I was the valedictorian. And in my class in, uh, of Ellicottville Central High, everyone who'd ever gone to college that I knew about had gotten pregnant and dropped out. So I had this idea that when I went to college, I was going to be washed out quickly. So I studied like, uh, you know, this was in the 60s and 70s. This was everybody's on birth control, having sex with everything not nailed down, and they're all smoking dope. And I am, I am here to study what is wrong with the rest of you people. I didn't understand what the Kent State thing was all about. You know, what are you doing? Okay, it's spring in Cleveland. You're throwing rocks at the horses on Euclid Avenue of the policemen. But I have a biology exam here. So there was this tremendous drive to achieve in a certain way, which was academically in a certain way. When I temporarily decided it would be easier to throw myself in front of a car and then quickly realize, you know, it's like mental health came on board quickly uh, because I grew up as a pretty optimistic person. Um, when my father said, so quit, it was that I had, I had the patriarchal authority figure in my family saying, you have another choice. You can quit. Come home. Live here. And in that moment, I could stay because I knew I could leave. Because I instantly, in that moment, thought, 
okay, what would I do in my hometown? What Would I marry my high school boyfriend? I mean, what would I do? Probably it would be better if I stayed here and finished this degree. But maybe I could finish it in a way that was a little lighter and more free. And what is the worst thing that could happen? You might get a B instead of an A. And what is the worst thing that could happen there? Probably nothing. And so I actually began to enjoy aspects of my life and live more in the moment. And then had the experience, actually, of getting a C in organic chemistry and being thrilled to pass. I had a big fibroid tumor in my late 40s, and uh, I was diagnosed on pelvic exam right after I finished my first book, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. So the first place I went in my head was, oh, I caught one. I've been around fibroids so long that I caught one. You know, when you're under stress, you go right back to your original um, programming, which is the germ theory of disease, right? So I must have caught one, like these things are contagious. And, um, but you know, the law of attraction is contagious. And I thought it was something about the book, because I knew fibroids were creativity that hasn't been birthed yet. And then it got bigger, and it got bigger, and it got bigger, until finally one Thanksgiving, I had that experience of, and I tried, you know, acupuncture twice a week, I was macrobiotic, I did everything known to humanity, and my patients had often been able to dematerialize fibroids, and I always knew it was possible, I couldn't. And I finally, one Thanksgiving, said, I'm so sick of dressing around this thing. I look pregnant. I'm just getting it out of here. I mean, that's what surgery's for. Let's go do it. And I knew enough when I went under anesthesia to have the anesthesiologist repeat some statements so that I would reprogram and go into sort of deep hypnosis. And the one statement was, and when you awaken, the pattern that created this will have left your life. And I was a single woman two years later.